Welcome back uh, to Sunrise Day. Well, David, let me bring this back to you. You know, uh, we hear some of these governors say certain things behind the scenes concerning some of the challenges they face uh, in their states with a view to formulating proper policies that will bring in investments. But we also hear some of them, too, say uh, when this investment coming, some of the resources or the revenue, the taxation doesn't come directly to them, the impediments, if they want to do more than one megawatt of power, the law won't allow it. So all of these matters, uh, when you speak about the management of the economy in the states, do they raise these issues? Because these are issues that people think that, you know, when they had that peer review mechanism in NGF, these topics come because the VP there was saying, look, if states have any challenges, whichever area that you think we can work together, bring it up, we will do it. Do governors ever bring up this kind of conversation? Uh, thank you, Chamberlain. I, I think that's one of the major mandates of the NGF. Uh, the, the NGF, when they meet, the primary reason is to share lessons and to share experiences. What's working in one state? How can we share these practices based on the lessons and the results that we've achieved? How can we share these lessons across other states? And I think that's one of the major mandates of the NGF. And I think that has been what has driven our conversation in recent times. So I'll give you an example. In terms of revenue generation, in the last three years, we've seen the growth in IGR grow by 20%. The compound annual growth rate has been about 20% from 821 billion naira in 2017 to about 1.1 trillion in 2018. And I think the challenges that we've had is that some of these reforms that they've implemented to raise IGR have been isolated and concentrated in only about half of the states. So a state that grows its IGR in one year might not be the same state that's growing in another year. And some of these reforms have been one-off. But one of the important conversations, even as related to what we're discussing today on economic management, is on how to build a social contract. So when we talk about economic management, we're not just talking about how to put you know, policies together, how to implement policies, but how do we influence the responsiveness of even the citizens and the private sector to pay their taxes? So we're talking about providing access to quality education, providing access to healthcare, quality healthcare services, providing infrastructure for the market woman in her market. She's not interested in a major bridge that is 20 kilometers away from where she is. She's interested in having drainage systems. She's interested in having security where she is. She's interested in making sure that the, the access from her own home to the market is tired. So some of these conversations are what state, state governments are beginning to have. How do you build a social contract? We've seen from the Lagos experience, we've seen from the Lagos experience, and even from Quara, we've seen improvements in tax collections because a number of state governments are beginning to understand that you need to provide services for the taxes you collect. And I think those are some of the conversations that they need to make. And I think in addition to economic management, I think one of the challenges that we have at the state level is also poor accountability and transparency. And I think that has been one of the major factors that has even inhibited some of the progress that we've seen. So if you want to talk about you know, um, payment of taxes, for example, the citizens are interested in knowing how much did you generate, what did you use the taxes for. So if budgets are published, if financial statements are published clearly, and these results show out there, and governments are able to explain some of these figures to the, to the citizens, some of these conversations will be better managed. Then I'll give you another instance. So if you, if you have um, um, budgets prepared, and you're talking about payment of salaries, now we're talking about the new salary regime coming up in the next few months. Now the question is, are states capable of paying these salaries? Even at 18,000, 26 states or 27 states were unable to pay just two years ago. How are we sure that they can pay 30,000 even with the same system? Not, not much has changed. In fact, the challenges have increased. But if budgets are prepared, if the financial statements are out there, if the figures are out there, the citizens would understand the data that are driving these decisions. So in the last three years, even between 2013 and 2018, we've seen FAC allocation to states decline from 3.1 trillion to about 2.1. So over four years, states have lost one point, about 1 trillion. And we're talking about a new minimum wage. If these figures are out there, if the social contract is better laid out, some of these conversations can be better had with the citizens and with labor 
and we were able to better manage the economies of states. You, you um, left out the part where the vice president said uh, to uh, the, uh, the, that, that um, induction that um, the federal government had paid 1.1 trillion naira in bailouts to states in the past three years, but that's beside the point. Uh, what, what would you say to the argument, David, that there is a need for states to collaborate more, like the example of Kebi and Lagos, uh, maybe even at the regional levels for economic development of each of the regions? What's your take on that? I think that's also a way of addressing some of the challenges that we have. So um, regional integration is a key component of addressing the challenges. We want to talk about taxation and multiple taxation and different tax regimes. So you have an industry or company operating in a number of states and they have different tax regimes. They have different regulations. How do we ensure that states across or within geographical confines or even with mutual um, value chain commodities, how can they better standardize their regulations, their taxes, and some of the services they provide so that across the value chain, industries have stability and they are better able to manage profits. And I think in the last three years, with the conversations around the, the vice president and the support given by the federal government, and I, I, don't, I don't think states have had this, you know, this good. You know, with, they, they, they received three bailouts. They received refund for Paris Club. They, they received refunds on even federal government um, roads taken. And I think the, the federal government has been very, very supportive. But the question is, in the future, where are all these monies coming from? How far can the federal government go in supporting states? That's why we need to have some of these wake-up conversations to ensure that states do not depend on the federal government and they are resilient to improve their fiscal sustainability. Um, David, I'm just wondering now, if it's not sustainable, they can't keep giving them handouts or bailouts or budget support, whatever they use in describing them. Isn't that the more reason why states should actually tell the federal government, look, well, if what we're getting is not enough, you have to do something about the revenue sharing formula? Yeah. No, I think some of those, those conversations have been had already. Even when we talk about, you know, the new minimum wage, state governments have clearly told the federal government that we are unable to pay these salaries unless some conditions are met. We do not have the finances to fund the new budget. We need a new revenue sharing formula. We need to understand better how far... We know the collection of VAT. I know some of the conversations that have been had in, the, in recent times has been, should we increase the VAT? And should we allocate more of those VAT receipts to the state government? But I think um, in the last, uh, by the end of last year, when we had the conversations around the minimum wage, state governments put clearly to the, to the federal government to let them know that we need to better, we need to create a new regime for our fiscal federalism. What we have at the moment will not work and it is not sustainable. We need to do something. And uh, as we have yes. conversations about the new minimum wage going yeah. forward, Pardon me to jump in. Conversations. Does that then suggest that if the states have highlighted this key problem of theirs to the federal government, is it double standard then for federal government to come back and say, well, whatever areas you think we can help, we will do it, if they haven't addressed the initial one that they've raised? So I, I think we need, we, need to be, we need to move beyond bailouts. We need to move beyond ad hoc interventions to create sustainable system for financing the economy of states. Um, uh, you, might, you might give one trillion now, but what, what happens the next year? What happens two years after? We need to better uh, create a Is new it double, framework for fiscal you, federalism. Do you consider it... the states for the roles. I hear you, David. That's what I'm asking. Do you consider a double standard on the part of the federal government then, if they've not done what states have suggested, and asking them to come up with suggestions? No, no, I, I don't think it's double standard. I think uh, at the moment, the, the federal government are putting in place some of these mechanisms as short-term palliatives. So when we had the fiscal crisis, states needed, at that point, they needed bailout facilities. That's why the federal government provided. But in terms of the conversations around resource control and fiscal federalism, those are long-term measures that will be carried out eventually. But at the short term, I think the federal government took upon itself to provide some of these short-term palliatives to ease the system and improve, you know, uh, the conditions of states. Well, Dr. Doji, if these are, these are not sustainable measures to grow any economy, society, whichever way, 
What should we be doing? I reckon that the fundamental problem we're contending with here is with the measure of measurement of economic progress. You know, I kept hearing people talk about the GDP, the GDP, the <laughs> GDP, and sometimes I sit back and I just laugh. Now, what does the GDP measure? Total amount of production within a particular geographical space by inhabitants or citizens of that space and foreigners in that space. The question, therefore, is that what is the ratio of economic activity of Nigerians within the Nigerian space? So when you see, you talk about your GDP growth, you're actually talking about growth of foreign participation in your economy, most of which is exported overseas. So there must be a transition, in, as it were, from using the GDP as a measure of growth to something you may call the SPI, the Social Progress Index, you know, where you can now make the GDP a component of the SPI. Now, what that does is that you can now have specifics to measure. This is the amount of houses we, have in we had in Nigeria last year. This is the amount this year. There should be a measure so that at least we can have a standard for judging the growth in the economy in real terms. It could include how much revenue you're able to generate last year, this year, how much creativity last year to this year. I'll give an example. I come from a part of the country where we have, I think, the fourth best grade of cashew in the country. And every cashew season, you see trucks upon trucks moving out of that part of the country, either to Lagos, for onward transfer to Ghana, then to Kenya, and then to Europe. Now, each time I see a truckload of cashew, you know what I see? I actually see employment going out of the country. Because this cashew are actually partly washed in Ghana, where you have about maybe, I think, about 1,500 to 200,000. So it's not even the finished product? It's not a finished product, it's a cashew, cashew, cashew nut. Oh. You know? So they are washed in Ghana by about 2,000 2, people, semi processed somewhere in East Africa by about 4,000 people, then ferried to Europe. So if we can begin to semi process our products here, we generate employment. And once we generate employment, we can now generate revenue. Why, do you, why are these things taking out? Why are these opportunities taking out? You see, because the focus of our leaders is on, is on things that are not, uh, as it were, people-related, things that are not sustainable. If we begin to judge our local government chairman by our, on account of performance, and we are, we, are, we are growing the CPIs, and judge the governments on account of those CPIs as well, then people will not be serious to providing these opportunities that will both increase, what, first and foremost, their revenue base, their creativity. Like I told you earlier, unless we begin to adopt an enterprise orientation, enterprise perspective to leadership, then we'll not get it right. But then we need to do a lot more than just that. Because one of the arguments that have been pushed forward by many people, even on this platform, is that a number of our people, a significant number of our people, are not employable, not responsible. Well, so see, sometimes when you, maybe the fear, I don't know, but maybe the, I, can't, I can't make case for anyone, but maybe the fear is, look, they're not going to deliver optimally on that thing. So what do we need to do to make our people employable get, and responsible? If you get the precepts wrong, the concepts be wrong, and then the context will maybe negatively impact the precepts. What that means is this. When you say someone is not employable, they actually look at somebody with a white-collar job. Must all of us be involved in white-collar jobs? Nobody is unemployable. That Not necessarily white-collar jobs. Yeah. Because even artisans, people, they, we have had people who complain even about artisans and their performance levels. I'm not talking about employing people. I'm talking about getting people to be self-reliant. Getting them to be net providers of jobs. They should employ people. I'm not asking about employing any. I'm actually talking about building entrepreneurs out of Nigerians. Getting them to do what they can do best. You see, uh, Chamberlain, there is something each individual will do better than every other person. Just be your original. Give them the work of government identity of this will create opportunities for people what, to, to, to identify themselves and impact society. You talked about leadership the yeah. other time, the leadership quotient. And we, Chamberlain asked, you know, the, the, about the our recruitment process of, of leaders. Let's talk a little about the youth, because that's the future. How are they faring in this whole arrangement? Well, in terms of how they are afraid, you can look at it first and foremost from an objective perspective and from a subjective perspective. Now, from an objective perspective, have they been given the opportunity to express themselves? The answer is actually no. Now, from a subjective perspective, which is a perspective of developing yourself and your potentials, look at the entertainment industry. It didn't take any government or any policy to engender what we see in the entertainment industry, which is now a multi billionaire industry. My take for the use is, you don't just sit back there and wait for somebody to give you the push. 
push yourself out there and people the, 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 the world is just too big to accept what you're offering to the world uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. No, Muda. No, 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 I'm not talking about <laughs> Now, let, let me just uh, bring an investment angle to this. Yeah, exactly. Because we are talking about job creation. We are talking about revenue generation. We are talking about poverty reduction. Because this is what development is all about. Yes. Investment is key to this. And if you look at the investment space, the states have a major role to play. The federal government also have a major role to play. Roles to play in the terms of the policy environment. Critical roles to play in terms of providing security. I mean, you can see what the security situation is right now in the country. All those states that have security problems, with the way things are, how many of them can attract investors? And without investors, how can you develop a state? How can you generate even this uh, so-called idea that you are talking about? But why does that, that, that then, doesn't that suggest that when you talk about investors, people yes. automatically think that you expect others, foreigners, to come in. But you can have people who we, could we come in of to course. that space within the country. Within the country, that. of course. When we talk, I mean, 80% of the jobs in this economy are provided by domestic investors. Many of them SMEs and all of that. But you need to create the environment for them to go to your state. That environment. You also need, no, just a minute. Okay. You also need to create infrastructure. Because you are talking about moving cashew from Lagos to, to either Port Harcourt or somewhere, or moving a tomato to process in Lagos. Or, you need infrastructure to make that happen. If you don't have the infrastructure, productivity in the economy will remain very low. And if the productivity remains low, you cannot diversify this economy. That is why it is still a very precarious thing as we are. But Depending so heavily on oil, because the non-oil sector of the economy, the challenges of producing, of creating jobs, of creating wealth is quite enormous. But you know, you know uh, Mr. Yusuf, that... you No, know, let me just land. And you also have the regulatory agencies. Because you need to bring a lot of things to the table. If you are talking about building an economy that is sustainable, whether at the national level or at the subnational level, the regulatory authorities have to bring something to the table. How friendly are they to investors? Are they revenue ag generating agencies or regulatory agencies? They talk about network, I mean, building regional economies and all of that. You can't build a regional economy if you don't have quality road infrastructure or the rail system. As an investor, as, yes. a, as a private sector practitioner, what are the challenges that you know beyond the policy that you know operationally that investors have to contend with? Security is a major issue now. It's a major issue. There are some areas that no investors will go at all as we speak. And the situation is not improving. The state governors, the state governors don't have power over, 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 over security agencies. The federal government has to create a secure environment. I mean, if, if, as an investor, if, if you don't feel safe in an environment, where will you, where, where will you go? Many industries have closed down in many of these security, uh, all these states that have security Actually, problems. Let's move to Ghana. Uh, yeah. add, add, add to the space, to, yes. to this mix of conversation that you're having now, with the ease of this whole talk about the ease of doing business, you know, you know in, in Nigeria. How, how well has government fared in that regard? Do you, do you see the environment in that, as, as a result of that, a little more investor-friendly or still just the same? Well, there have been some, some improvements, some impacts, especially on some soft issues like registering business, uh, airports in and out, uh, air, passports and all those things. But the fundamental factors that drive investment, like power. I mean, you want to invest now, you have to go and buy 100 kVA, the rate of 200 kVA. Refurbished. That will be gold, gold being a diesel. Diesel at 240, 250 naira per liter. How can you create jobs with that? It's difficult. So are you then So saying? the power issue remains a major issue. The financing issue is still a major issue. These are issues in which the federal authorities have a major role to play to bring that about. Uh, then you need all your foreign exchange policy issues. These are not federal issues. You have issues, I mean, they are federal issues. You have issues with the ports. You have issues with customs. These are investors, and they go through a lot of hazards on daily basis. Dr. Adoji, you, know? you talked about uh, 
the, the first issue you mentioned was that of um, uh, in our attitude, our character, and stuff like that. Uh, the number of people who want to do business with governments at the federal or state level or agencies that you talked about the other time, they usually complain about the attitude of the workers there. How, how much does that affect uh, business or the growth of the economy? Attitude is everything. Attitude is virtually everything. Is it costable? Of course. Of course. Um, the greatest measure of attitude in the corporate world is actually provision of service. And the question you ask is, if you go to take a haircut, what are the decisions that you, you take to arrive at who your baba is? Oh, good morning, Chamberlain. How are you? How is your family? Gives you a massage, takes care of you, and when you are going, say, okay, say hi to your family. At no cost to him. You know, the fact that this person shows concern, you know, creates, whether or not you like it, a bond between you and him. So attitude is actually that aspect that creates the bonding. So if attitude is missing, then virtually everything is missing. I'm actually talking from the extroverted point of view. Now, from the introverted point of view, someone slept without a good uh, you know, sleeping condition the, the, the previous night. Takes him about four or five hours to get to the office, three hours and hold up. You know, he gets to the office and then takes him another one hour to get in because everything is just not working. So that impacts the person's internal attitude. So like Dr. Muda said earlier, if we can put all this infrastructure in place, countries are actually looking at electricity per capita, internet per capita. Nigeria has about, uh, Nigeria is battling with about, is it uh, 30,000 uh, megawatts? Is that what Nigeria is battling, battling to achieve? That is less than what it takes to run the train from Leeds, you know, in the UK to London. We're actually not serious yet. And until we get, like he's saying, those substructures correctly, those basics correctly, then we're not serious about moving the economy yet. Well, David, let me take this back to you. I mean, in all of those recommendations that, you know, the Secretariat gives to governors, do you, what kind of impression do you get? Do they take them on board? How do they internalize them? Do they uh, take them seriously? Do you see that reflect? in some of the uh, projects or actions that they carry out? Um, be, be, before, I, before I comment on that, I think I should say one or two things on, on what one of your guests mentioned. By you talked means. about you know, um, governments focusing on GDP. But I think it's, it's important that we set some of these perspectives clearer. What the GDP does is um, it, it's, it's it's a necessary condition, but it's not a sufficient condition. So it's not necessarily the, 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 the economic scorecard of the state. What it does is it measures the activities of businesses over a given period. And an example of how the GDP can help influence policies, if you look between 2000 and 2015, so a decade and a half, you would see that the GDP growth of Nigeria was around, it averaged around 7%. And over that time, Unemployment was rising, poverty was rising, but our GDP was growing at a rate of 7%. So the challenge is not just about GDP growth, but where that growth is coming from. Within that period I just mentioned, services was growing a lot faster. In fact, the industrial sector was declining. So between 2000 and 2015, you will see that the industrial sector declined from about 40% to about 22% now. So where are the jobs coming from? The jobs are leaving the industrial sector and are going into low productivity services sector. So the, G the GDP doesn't just tell you how much progress has been made or the growth rate. It also tells you what, where the growth has been coming from. And with that statistics, you are better able to manage or influence policies targeted at the areas that we want. So in the last decade and a half, we've, seen, we've experienced deindustrialization. So while our economy has been growing, Industry has been declining, and that has been a major issue on manufacturing, and that has been a major issue around the jobs we provide. So, in, so um, I'll come back to your question. You talked about our own uh, discussions we have with the governors, and I think in the last couple of years, we've seen a lot of progress, especially around challenges on raising revenue. And, some of, and, and, and I will tell you that one of the biggest selling points that we have is that at the NGF level, when governors meet, there's, there's huge competition. 
governors compete amongst themselves. We find that very, very healthy. They compete amongst themselves. So as much as we present some of these details and they see how their colleagues perform, they take more action to influence the activities at the subnational level. So for IGR, for example, uh, you, you know, in, in the last decade, the conversation has been around how Lagos has been able to grow its revenue. But in recent times, we have seen other states who are coming out who are good examples and with lessons that we are able to influence the, the activities of others. So Quara, for example, in the last couple of years, has raised its revenue significantly. We've seen increase in social contracts. We've seen increase in collection from the inf 